Hi class, uh, so we're going to continue our survey of the solar system today. Uh, last time we talked about exploring some of the major worlds, the planets. Um, we're going to come back to Mars next week and we'll spend a lot of time talking about Mars and Venus. Uh, but today what I want to do is I want to talk about the smaller worlds in the solar system. Uh, and in this part of the lecture, we're going to spend a little time talking about spacecraft in particular. Now, uh, I will note for those of you who are keeping up with the reading uh, that I had listed at the beginning of the week only chapter seven, I think, for uh, reading. Uh, but I always intended to talk about uh, the smaller worlds uh, today on Friday. And uh, when I went back to the book and looked, that's actually all covered in chapter nine. So when I post all of this, um, I will add chapter nine to this week's readings. And so those of you who are keeping up, uh, you should certainly take a breeze through chapter nine uh, and see what it has to say. Okay, so uh, in the picture behind me, uh, since we're going to talk about spacecraft, uh, is one, a very modern spacecraft called Dawn. So Dawn in 2015 visited the dwarf planet Ceres, which you can see there in the background. Um, this was a very notable spacecraft because it was the very first spacecraft to employ what's called an ion drive. So that's a very special type of electric propulsion. Uh, it basically uses strong electric fields uh, to propel little small uh, bits, uh, atoms typically, um, at very high velocity. And so it makes it very efficient. Uh, it's very slow, but uh, the efficiency more than makes up for the fact that you don't have to carry fuel around with you. Uh, the use of ion drives uh, requires enormous amounts of energy to generate the electricity. And so you can see Dawn has these uh, large uh, solar panels uh, out to the side to generate the energy it needs to drive its ion drive. So Dawn visited Ceres and orbited Ceres uh, in 2015, uh, and we'll end this segment of today's lecture with some discussions about some of the things that we uh, learned there about Ceres. So let me go ahead and start a few slides. So this is, uh, this is actually one of my favorite spacecraft uh, in history. Uh, this is uh, the Pioneer probes. They were the first probes that we had ever sent to the outer solar system. Um, and uh, Pioneer uh, will come back to at the very end, uh, the last couple of weeks of the course, when we start talking about uh, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, because Pioneer carried on it one of the very first um, uh, uh, records. Uh, meant to tell the universe about us uh, should someone ever stumble across uh, one of the Pioneer spacecraft. Uh, but I put it here because I want you to look, just look generically at spacecraft design with the view toward the fact that spacecraft have to do a whole bunch of things independently of the rest of us. And so when you look at Pioneer, uh, the big dish that's facing away from you here, looking towards the sun that you can see there in the distance, uh, that is the radio. That's what it uses for communication. It sent signals back to us and received signals from us. Uh, the two lower booms that kind of stick out down to the lower uh, left and straight out to the right, those have out at the ends of them those little things that look like they have rudders on them. Those are uh, nuclear generators, so out uh, past uh, the orbit of the asteroid belt. Uh, there's not enough sunlight to generate energy with solar panels, so you have to carry nuclear power. So Pioneer uh, carried nuclear generators with it. Uh, the long uh, antenna-like thing sticking up to the upper left, that is a magnetometer. It's one of the instruments on Pioneer. It was measuring magnetic fields. Um, and then all of the kind of gold stuff in there are the instrument packages that were on Pioneer. So every spacecraft is kind of designed with these kinds of things in mind. How does it get power? How does it talk to us? Where does the scientific instruments go? Um, and so on. And so this is the kind of core bit of, thing, of technology that we keep in mind when we design spacecraft. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so uh, we'll start here. We'll talk just a little bit about the different ways we can use spacecraft to explore the solar system. Uh, we'll then talk about uh, very generically the smaller worlds and some of the prospects. Um, and then I'll spend uh, the last bit of this segment talking about Ceres. The next lecture segment uh, for today, uh, we'll talk about the moons around the outer planets. So when you're exploring the solar system, the basic uh, problem is getting from Earth to wherever you want to go. Now, one of the things that uh, you should do is you should dig up your uh, 
solar system map that we made at the beginning of the uh, quarter, right, the first week there. And if you look where Earth is, uh, the farthest any human has been from Earth is the moon. Okay, so on the scale of a four foot piece of paper, the moon is less than the width of a pencil line away from Earth. That's all the farther that humans have ever been. The total scale of the solar system is about 16,000 times larger if you go all the way out to where Pluto is. Okay, so the difficulty in robotic exploration, uh, in any exploration of a spacecraft, is simply the scale of the solar system. It's enormous. You have long distances to go and long places to go. And so when you're designing missions to get from Earth to wherever you want to go, the things you have to consider are things like how long will it take to get there? Will my spacecraft survive that far? What can I do to get it there quicker? What can I do to stop it when it gets there? How is it gonna to talk to me when it's so far away? All of those things matter, okay? So there are kind of three fundamental types of missions that we do. So the one that most of us are familiar with is what we would call a lander mission. So you send a rocket up, it takes a, a space probe with it uh, on its way, and the whole goal of that probe is to land on the surface of some extraterrestrial body. So this is how we began. Uh, the very first missions uh, to send landers to other worlds were to the moon. Uh, the very initial ones were just can we hit the moon? So they basically crashed on the moon. And then later, what we call soft landing so that the, the lander survives uh, to the surface is what's, uh, what's done. So today we have uh, Mars as our primary target for landers, although we have landed other places in the solar system. We've landed on comets, we've landed on asteroids, we've landed on uh, some of the moons uh, around uh, Saturn. Uh, but Mars has been our primary place. And so these days we've been using, uh, we've used rockets to land on Mars, we've used airbags to land on Mars, we've used a sky crane to land on Mars. So we're really getting creative with the kinds of technology we use. Um, and the need for that technology Technology is driven by the fact that our robots that we're sending are getting more sophisticated and so they're getting bigger and so they're getting heavier and so if we want to send a smart robot that basically has really smart laboratories on board uh, then we have to come up with creative ways to land big things on other planets okay so the advantages of landers is that uh, you can uh, get up close to the planet that you want to see but the disadvantages is that landing safely is hard Okay, so we've sent, uh, what is it, something like 20% uh, uh, of the missions that go to Mars actually succeed. Okay, it's some, some really low number like that. Landing is really hard. Um, and when you do land, you're very limited. So if you have a lander, then you're basically stuck with wherever you land and however far whatever robotic arms you put on your lander are. But we've kind of mitigated that. We've started sending rovers and the current difficulty with rovers is that they go slow um, and so they can only go so far and they can't navigate over all hazards, right? So um, they can't get over some, but like there's a giant, you know, crevasse in the way or a giant canyon in the way they can't get over it, okay? Now, another mission mode that we often do is something called a flyby. And this is particularly popular uh, early on in the space program before we had ever worked uh, out uh, all the uh, necessary technology for how to get into orbit around the planet. Uh, but it's very popular and very useful for the outer solar system because when you do a flyby, um, you're basically not trying to stop. Okay, and so if you're not trying to stop, that makes your spacecraft much smaller because you don't have to carry fuel. Um, and it also means that you can uh, get out to where you're going faster. So what you see here in this picture is I fly by Jupiter, but I use the fact that Jupiter's gravity made me go faster and flung me to the outer solar system to go on to Saturn. Okay, so the, the ex exploration we've done at the outer solar system has all been done with this uh, kind of flyby technology. The only spacecraft that have ever visited Uranus and Neptune is uh, Voyager 2, uh, and it was done by flybys and gravity assists, like I just described here. So the advantages of flybys is you can get to faraway places very quickly. And by, I put quickly in quotes uh, because it still takes many years to get to most places. So uh, it took Voyager about three years to get uh, from Earth uh, out. 
Um, it took New Horizons 10 years to get from Earth to Pluto. So quickly is kind of in the eye of the beholder, but here what we mean by quickly is less than the human lifetime. Okay, the problem with flybys is if you're going to get to the outer solar system quickly, uh, you're going to be going pretty fast. And when you're going really fast, it's very hard to stop. Um, and when you're going really fast, the time that you're up close to wherever you're going to explore is actually very, very short. So your total time that you may be in the Jupiter system or sailing past Saturn may only be a day or two at most. Uh, the total time we spent close to Pluto during the New Horizons encounter was something like 14 hours. It's just a really very tiny amount of time. Okay, so uh, the third mode of operation is basically an orbiter. So orbiters, you can uh, slow down and let the gravity of the planet capture you, and then you go into orbit around that planet just like a satellite might orbit the Earth. So we've done this many times around Mars. We've done it around Venus. Uh, it has been done once around Mercury uh, with the Messenger spacecraft. It's been done once, uh, now twice around Jupiter, once with Galileo, once with Juno, and it's been done once at Saturn with uh, the Cassini spacecraft, okay? But nowhere else have we ever done orbits, okay? Uh, or, sorry, around no other planets, okay? So uh, the advantages of orbiters is you get to spend a lot of time at the planet, right? So Cassini was around Saturn for something like a decade, right? So you get to spend a lot of time, you get to take a lot of pictures, you get to make a lot of scientific uh, measurements. Uh, but the disadvantage is you can't get close, right? So if you're orbiting Mars and you take a really great picture of something on Mars, so for instance, we've discovered caves on Mars. Okay, but we haven't ever landed anywhere close to a cave. There's no way a rover can get to a cave. The only reason we're even aware of the existence of the caves on Mars is because we've seen them from orbits. Okay, so that's the disadvantage of orbiters. Okay, so these are all the basic modes of robotic operations. Um, and if you know anything about your space exploration history, we have, uh, you know, in many different ways utilized and formed uh, these different ideas into missions that have slowly completed the entire reconnaissance of the solar system. So uh, in the top row there, those are all missions to the outer planets. That's Cassini, uh, which spent uh, a lot of time at Saturn. Uh, that mission is now over. It, uh, we crashed it into Saturn at the end of the mission. Uh, Pioneer, which was the very first mission to Jupiter and uh, Saturn. Uh, and Voyager. So Voyager is currently the oldest operating spacecraft uh, in the outer solar system. It has traveled far past Pluto. It's now something like uh, three, uh, three times the distance from the sun than Pluto, and it is passing the boundary between our solar system um, and the intergalactic space. So it's the boundary where the influence of the sun um, is becoming overwhelmed by the influence of the other stars in the galaxy. So Voyager has now crossed that boundary. And it's still talking to us, and we expect it will talk to us for maybe another 10 years or something. Uh, on the bottom, these are both missions from Mars. Uh, I showed you a picture of uh, uh, the missions to Venus last time. These are both from Mars. So over on the bottom left there, that's Mars Pathfinder, the little rover there you can see against the rock. The rock's name is Yogi because it looks like a bear. Uh, and the name of the rover is Sojourner. So this was the very first Mars rover that we ever sent uh, to Mars. Uh, so it was on Mars Pathfinder. Uh, Pathfinder was kind of shaped like a, like a tetrahedron or a four-sided dice if you play Dungeons and Dragons. That tetrahedron unfolded in petals and on one of the petals was the rover. And you can see the little ramp for the rover. And so it drove down uh, onto the surface of Mars and cruised around and looked at various rocks there. Uh, in the area. Uh, Pathfinder's rover, uh, Sojourner, is just kind of like about the size of a microwave. It's really a tiny rover, uh, but it was the first one on Mars and kind of proved the concept for us. Later rovers have been much larger, so the current uh, rover that's uh, active is called Curiosity, and you can see it over there on the uh, right. So Curiosity is much larger. It's about the size of a, of a mini, okay, a mini Cooper. Uh, so it was landed on Mars with the sky crane. It uh, is very big, very massive rover, uh, and it has a lot of scientific instruments. It has very large footprint, so it can travel around uh, Mars uh, to great distances. Um, it has a nuclear power plant, so it can operate through the Martian winter or in the Martian summer. Uh, you see there at the top of the uh, uh, rover, there's a mast. 
uh, with its camera and its laser that it uses to uh, uh, take rock samples. Um, and it's taking, uh, this is basically a selfie it took with the camera on the end of its robotic arm. So our, our space probes are getting good enough that they can take selfies and, uh, and participate in the whole selfie trace. Okay, so, so we, we have gotten very good at building robots. Um, they are very robust. They generally succeed. Uh, they're very capable, uh, especially now compared to what they were like at the beginning of the space age. They still aren't terribly smart. Uh, you know, they may be as smart as a grasshopper or something, uh, but they, but they uh, are very good at taking orders and we send them with plenty of capability. So if we see, uh, especially the rovers, if we see something interesting, we can send the rover over to it. It can look around it from all sides. It can drill into it. Um, it can take laser samples of the rocks. It can take pictures. It can take micro, uh, micrograph pictures up close. They can do all sorts of different things uh, now. So our capabilities are getting better, uh, but that's why the spacecraft are getting bigger is because we're building more capabilities into them. Okay, so why are we putting so much effort into spacecraft? Well, the farthest any human's ever been is the moon. It took us four days to get there. So spacecraft can make journeys that you and I certainly can't. And when we look at the solar system, there are some 88 objects that are larger than 200 miles. So if you eliminate the uh, nine planets, there are some 79 uh, other worlds that could be explored. And it, with larger than 200 miles, that's a lot of surface area, and that's a lot of different places to explore. And in fact, most of them, if you look at the diagram that I just showed you here, most of them we don't know anything at all about. We know where they are, we've picked up a bit of light with them in our telescope, they're, but they're very nondescript. We just know their size, we know nothing about their surfaces, their structure, what they look like, or anything like that at all. The only way we'll ever learn anything about any of these worlds is to go visit them up close. But it's, it's a lot of places to explore, and spacecraft, you know, they can't go everywhere. Okay, so our job, our goal here is to figure out which one of these places might be interesting for us to go explore. Now, the most numerous object in the solar system uh, are the comets and the asteroids. And so uh, most of the comets uh, are, uh, are from the outer solar system, where the Kuiper Belt, where many of those 88 objects that we just looked at um, live. Um, they are icy, rocky bodies, and the asteroids are rocky bodies or metallic bodies. Um, the life prospects on such objects is very, very low, okay? So it's not that we want to visit these places or understand these places because we're looking for life on them, but because they are roughly primordial objects, they were formed in the very earliest moments of the formation of the solar system, but they've evolved and changed very little since then. They provide a really good record of what the early conditions and early chemistry and early makeup of the solar system was really like. And as we've discussed in previous weeks, one of the things that we would like to know more about is what are the conditions under which life formed. And so part of that recipe for understanding the early conditions is understanding what the materials and what the environment in the early solar system was like. So while we don't necessarily need to go to any asteroids or think we need to go to any comets to look for life, we do need to understand them better because it's part of the story of how we understand life better. Okay? Okay. So let's talk about uh, some of the small bodies. So in this segment, I'm just going to talk about Ceres. Uh, and then in the next segment of the lecture, we'll talk about the uh, moons in the outer solar system because they're all kind of part of the same story. But I want to talk about Ceres because it's the only thing in the inner solar system uh, that's not a planet. Now, those of you who know a little bit of your astronomical history will know that Ceres has been through a series of demotions, not unlike Pluto. When Ceres was first discovered, it was called a planet. Um, it was located in a position predicted by the Titus Bode law, which we talked about um, early on when we made our maps of the solar system, okay? Uh, but uh, it was rapidly demoted uh, once we began to discover many other things at roughly the same orbital distance that the Titus Bode law predicted. We now know that all of those things that we discovered are the asteroids in the main belt. And so Ceres was demoted to asteroid. It was one of the many asteroids that lived in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now, uh, with all the kerfuffle uh, about demoting um, uh, Pluto, 
the uh, ad hoc definition that we've adopted for planet and dwarf planet and what they mean has been extended to all the bodies in the solar system. And so Pluto is considered a dwarf planet by the arbitrary definition that was made. And if you apply it to Ceres, Ceres also falls in the category of dwarf planet. It is the largest object in the asteroid belt. It's large enough that its gravity is strong enough to make it round, which you can see here in the picture. Um, it is uh, a heavily cratered object, not unlike the moon or Mercury. Uh, so uh, it has that, that kind of lifeless world uh, aura about it that we have uh, when, we, when we look at worlds like uh, 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 the moon and Mercury. But when you look at the surface of uh, Ceres there, so this is a picture by Dawn, and we could see this as Dawn was approaching Ceres, you'll notice those bright white spots there, okay? And those bright white spots are very interesting. We don't know exactly what caused them, but what we, but, but, but we have some ideas. Um, so as we approached the series and we began to understand it more, uh, we discovered that its surface is more carbon rich than other carbon-like asteroids that we see carbonaceous asteroids, as we call them. It's about five times more carbon than, than uh, other carbonaceous asteroids. Um, and the surface uh, there is uh, largely hydrated minerals, as we call them. Um, and we see evidence of what we call cryovolcanism. So this is cold water volcanic activity, possibly on the surface of Ceres. Okay, so uh, Dawn went into orbit around Ceres, which allows us to measure its gravity, measure its um, uh, density and uh, various properties to very high accuracy. And it's got very low density, uh, especially for its size. And based on the observations that we made with Dawn and the, the materials uh, composition that we see here on the surface, we think it's very likely that there is a subsurface ocean of some sort below Ceres, okay, uh, below the surface of Ceres. Um, it's probably not liquid, it's probably a slushy mantle of some sort, or muddy is a term uh, that's often uh, used. Um, so in the interior core there, you got the crust that we can see, uh, but the uh, interior mantle, whatever it is, we think is probably very high uh, salt content, high salinity. Uh, that's related to the fact that we see a lot of uh, salt content on the surface as well. We think it's probably slushy. Um, we don't see any evidence of really strong sources of heat that might keep it liquid, but based on the density, um, and uh, 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 the temperatures that we see on Ceres and the salinity that we think it is, um, it very likely is this kind of slushy mix of uh, rock and debris and kind of partially iced frozen water, okay? The core is also very light. We can tell that from the orbit of Dawn as it goes around Ceres. Uh, but given the size of the core, um, it's, it can't all be ice. Uh, 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 it's got to be some rock. Um, but given how low the density is, the, su the supposition is that maybe it's very porous. And so then those porous areas in the core might also be filled with this kind of slushy uh, interior material, okay? Now, the question of those bright spots that you saw here on the surface here, so uh, the brightest one there on the, um, on the right is called Akator Crater. Um, so we, we thought initially as we were approaching that those might be ice deposits. Uh, but what we now think they are is we think they are salt deposits and that what those were caused by is uh, material, uh, water, uh, or uh, liquidy slushy water from underneath, bursting up onto the surface at some point in Ceres past, perhaps when the crater itself was made. And then that material, as it evaporated into space, left these salt deposits behind, okay? So this is a movie that NASA made uh, uh, from the um, uh, uh, Dawn data. Uh, the link to the movie is down there at the bottom if you wanna get a copy of it, self, uh, copy of it yourself. Um, so what you're seeing here is we're going around just the center of the crater. The peaks there you see are something that's very common in craters that we see around the solar system. They're called central peaks. 
So when the crater is created, the, the landscape rebounds and makes a, a central mountain. Uh, but the center of the crater is also where it's deepest and probably had the most penetrating impact from uh, the event that caused the crater. And so that's where the salt deposits are uh, because that's where most of the material from uh, the event that created Akator uh, probably welled up. Okay, so Ceres is very interesting because it is a close place to us that has uh, possible water. Water is one of the things that we're definitely looking for when we look for life. It has high carbon rich uh, environments. So that's certainly one of the things we look for when we're looking for life because we, life needs raw materials. But given the fact that the planet, uh, the planet, the dwarf planet is very small, uh, its gravity is very light, there's no atmosphere, it's very cold. Um, we still think that the likelihood that there's life there is low. Now, if there is some subsurface ocean, we'll come, we'll come back to this idea in the next half, if there is some subsurface ocean, there's some source of heat that's keep, keeping it uh, melted or at least slightly slushy, then there's always the possibility that if there's that much heat around, that maybe some form of life has learned to exploit it. Uh, but despite the fact that we see these kinds of conditions, uh, we think it's probably unlikely uh, that there's life on Ceres at all, okay? But Ceres is, uh, you know, like many places in the solar system, it's very interesting. It has a lot to teach us about the nature of different environments we can see. Um, it has a lot to teach us about the history of the solar system and how the environments in the solar system evolve. Um, and in particular, uh, this is a theme we'll come back to over and over again over the next uh, few, few chats we have, is when we see worlds like this that have these uh, supposed deep interior oceans, we can do very simple calculations, very simple estimates, very simple models for what we think is keeping those oceans liquid. And it's very clear that we don't understand where all the energy is coming from. And if we don't understand where all the energy is coming from, that means we don't really understand all the possible sources of energy, which as you and I discovered when we were talking about life on Earth, can lead to very exotic and very uh, unusual uh, ecosystems if life figures out how to utilize the energy. So what you should have in mind there are the deep ocean vents where we had no concept that there might be ecosystems around ocean vents where the water is highly acidic and where the water is highly hot, but somehow life figured out a way to adapt it, uh, to that environment. So when we're talking about the outer solar system and these worlds in particular, which may have subsurface oceans, this is the kind of thing that's always floating in the back of our mind. This is the high uncertainty we have is we don't know what the environments are really like, so we don't really know what life might be doing to exploit them. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say in this part. Uh, the next part of the lecture will go farther out into the solar system, uh, and we're going to talk about the moons around the Jovian planets. Okay, so I hope you're all doing well. Take care of yourselves, and I'll talk to you again soon.